So now we move on to making the LFS system bootable. So this is quite a critical part and a place where it's easy to make mistakes. So first thing we've got to do is create a file system table. And what this does, it tells the system where our partitions are, uh, what they're called, where we want them mounted and with what options. So again, I've copied the uh, default, the example that's in the book, and now I'm going to edit it by hand and uh, modify it to suit this system. And generally each system is different. So these ones here we don't need to touch. They're generally good enough as they are. But the ones we want to modify are the first two and we want a third one because we've got a separate boot partition which will need to be um, added as well. Now traditionally um, the way of doing this has been to use device names. So the root on this system is SDA1. Uh, sorry, SDA3, that's the root file system. It's an ext4 uh, file system, so I'll put that in. Uh, the swap is on SDA2, so I'll leave that there. And as I said, we've got to put in our boot, which is slash dev slash SDA1. That will get mounted at boot. It's an ext4. And um, options, I normally do no auto here. So actually I'll do defaults. But also add in uh, no auto. That means that it won't automatically get mounted. And that's a safety feature. So that um, it because it won't get mounted, there's a, a more chance that files won't be deleted or some corruption might happen to the partition because it's not mounted, it's not visible to the system. The dump, um, don't probably don't want to dump this. Sometimes I'd set that to one, but uh, file check you probably want to boot up, just set that to two so it, it does the file check um, after the root file system's been processed. So that's the file system tab, the SF tab. Now there is another more robust way of configuring this and that's through using something called UUIDs. If I go back to the live CD prompt, um, now I always forget this, come on, is it block ID? Yes, it is. Um, just need to look at block ID for the boot disk, which is SDA something. So what this does, it shows us the universal IDs for each of the partitions that are on the disk. So SDA1 is our boot partition. SDA2 is our swap partition, as you can see here. And SDA3 is the boot partition. Now, on some systems, if you, for example, leave a USB uh, drive plugged in, it can affect the naming of the hard disk within the system. Um, or if you add or remove disks, it can affect it. And that means that if, for example, you had an extra drive plugged in, a USB drive, it might mean that USB drive picks up the SDA and your hard disk in the machine picks up SDB, that would now mean that this file system table is invalid because it's pointing at what would be the USB stick, for example, or the new disk you've added. And obviously the system wouldn't boot. Now a way around this is to use these UUIDs. Now they're a bit messy in the FS tables. Uh, yeah, the FS tab file, as you can see, this is quite nicely laid out. Uh, but it gets a bit messy because these UUIDs are so long um, but as I say, it's protection against anything moving around. So if you know you've got this problem, you might want to configure your system to boot like this. So if I copy the first UUID, which is for the um, boot partition, we can actually 
get rid of this and paste in that UUID. I don't think you need the quotes, so I'll remove them. And you can see because that number's so long, it puts all the tabulation out of order. So what I tend to do is just get rid of these extra spaces so that I try and make everything fit on one line if that's possible. Like so. So that's the boot partition. So if I go back to this and next one we've got is the swap partition. So I'll copy the UUID for that. Now these will never change until you, I think, reformat the partitions. I think that's when they change. So in theory, they'll, they'll never change because um, you're not going to be formatting um, a system that you're using. So I paste that in. Again, I'm pretty sure you don't need the quotes. I'm, I'm not even sure if the quotes would make a difference if they're ignored anyway, if you do leave them in. So again, I'll just get rid of the spaces. I'll try and keep the tabulation to some extent. So that's that one. And in fact, I might want to put some comments here saying that slash dev slash sda2 is the swap and slash dev slash sda1 is the is the boot partition because it's not so obvious now everything's all bunched up might be easy to read so the last one we've got to do i'll put the comment in first now so slash def slash sda3 is the root partition so again i just need to get rid of this um, copy the UUID, will that copy? No, it won't copy all if I double click. So I'll just have to copy that. Yes, that's right. The UUID gets changed. I'll just notice the partition UUID. So the UUID gets changed when you format the partition and the part UUID is obviously the partition. And you can see that's related to the actual disk ID, the, um, what they call PTU ID. Uh, it's just got a dash 03002 or 01 on the end. So I've got that UUID. I'll paste that in here, remove the quotes again, and then just tidy up the extra spaces so that it is tabulated somewhat to the rest of the UUID entries. So it's a little bit neater, a little bit easier to read. So that should be the FS tab done. Uh, and it shows there some options, some extra options you can add in. Um, and there's a bit about um, X3 file systems to make them reliable across uh, power failures. Um, and something there about logical volume management based partitions cannot use the barrier option. So that's the configuration done. Um, we move now on to compiling a kernel. So again, this can get a little bit hairy as we've got to pick some drivers to make sure that things work, such as the network, um, they work at boot up. So we need to first of all go back to sources and extract the Linux archive. I 
Okay, now we change into it. And we can now run this command here to ensure that the source is clean and tidy, ready for use. And then we go into configuring the kernel. Now I found the easiest way to get going with a kernel on a brand new machine is to run a target called make uh, def config. And what that will do, it will create a default config file based on the architecture that you're using. So you'll see at the end, it's created a default configuration based on 64 bit architecture. And that's a good way to get going. Uh, if you've got a config file from a previous installation on the same machine then what you can do is use that config file and then run a target called make old config which will take that config and update it for the current kernel uh, if it's too far different what it'll actually do i believe is just to create a default config anyway um, but that is quite a good way to uh, get going as it says here in fact uh, it should say that first rather than um, after the make menu config. Um, yeah, this is a bit of leftover from how they used to specify uh, to run the commands. I've never found they're absolutely necessary. Um, I think this page needs tidying up actually. Um, well, I guess they are, I suppose it says they're optional. It's, yes, it it's not absolutely necessary to use these. I did find when using these that the interface got a bit garbled and the graphical lines got a bit messed up. So, yeah, we've run the def config. As I say, maybe that should be mentioned before the make menu config. But now we've run that def config. We've got a .config file. So it's an actu actually it's a hidden file. You can't see it there, but if you're doing ls la. You can see that's the config file that's just been created. If we now run make menu config, it will use that .config file as a reference. And you can see this is the menu um, for the uh, Linux configuration. Now it says to be sure to enable, disable, or set the following features or the system might not work correctly or boot at all so let's go into each one of these to check what's what so you can see that the first one it's got is general setup so that's the top level menu if you like we'll go into that and it says to make sure that compile the kernel with warnings as errors is not selected so we'll remove that the next one it's got is enable kernel headers through the syskernel kernel headers .tar.xz so let's look for that there it is at the bottom so yeah that's already disabled so we'll just leave it as it is um, we'll exit that the next one we've got is under device drivers so that's down here press enter to go into that then we need to go to graphics support which is a couple of screens down there it is there, go into that. Then we need to look for something called frame buffer devices. Um, which is near the bottom, I think. Yep, there it is there, we'll go into that. Then press uh, space to set that, press it twice. Or you can press yes to, if I press Y, it'll immediately put the star in. Now I can press enter to go into this menu and it looks like I don't need to set anything there uh, for now anyway so the next thing we've got to go to is back up to device drivers and we want to look for generic driver options so I'm not sure where that is that might be near the top possibly oh no there it is no, that's not it. Okay, so although it's underneath graphics support, it looks like it's near the top somewhere. So let's go back to the top. There it is. Yeah, it's just a few down from the top of the list. Press enter to go into that. 
So we don't want the U event helper, so that's already not selected, so that's fine. The next one we want is maintain a dev temp fs, which is already selected, and so is the next one, auto mount dev temp fs as well. So that's okay. Enable some additional features if you are building a 64 bit system. If you are using menu config, enable them in the order of config PCI MSI first. So that's that option there. So let's do that one first. Um, and the reason why it says to do in this order because certain ones only appear when certain other options have been um, enabled. So let's go all the way back up to the top. Oh, I'll save that now. I've gone too far. Let's go back in again. And we want processor type and features, which is that one. So we want to go, sorry, no, we don't. We want device drivers again. You see, this is the top level here. So I press enter there. And then we want PCI support, which is that one. And then we want to select message signaled interrupts config so it's already set you can double check this this is the symbol that's given to this option if we do help that symbol appears up here so you can see that confirms sometimes the descriptions change but the symbols should always stay the same so that's already selected that's okay then it says to check config irq remap which is this one here so we need to go up one, sorry, not on that window. On this window, we need to exit up one and find IO MMU hardware support, which is a little way down here, I think. Yep, there it is there. We need to go into that and then we need to find support for interrupt remapping. And there it is there. So we'll select that. And as it's, oh no, is there more? Yes, there's more. And last of all, x86x2apic, which is this one here. So we need to go back to process the type and features now, which is up here. It might be better if they'd laid this out in a bit more of a logical order, perhaps. Um, support X2 APIC. And there, that's that one there. And that'll actually tell us if we do help, it'll tell us um, what it does, it allows 32 bit APIC IDs. Okay, uh, it does say for 64 bit systems, but uh, maybe that allows us to run 32 bit software possibly. Uh, and then the last one we need to check is to ensure that this option under memory, memory management is not set. So let's go back to this window, exit, and we need to go to memory management options, which is this one, and look for enable user default FD. There it is there, it's already unset, so that's fine. There are several other options that may be desired depending on the requirements of the system. And if you go through BLFS, there are several packages that have requirements for uh, the packages. And if you're using UEFI, it should have been mentioned if you've been building from the BLFS, the UEFI, UEFI system, that certain parameters need to be set in the kernel there. And here's the explanation for these. So there's an explanation there about the X2 APC, A APIC. Now there's one or two other options that I find are useful to set. So let's go through them if I can find them. Um,
yeah, it's this one, is to just add a little name to the kernel. And I find this useful if I want to move a kernel between machines. Um, the kernel file name will have a, a, well, basically any text you enter here attached to the, the name, and it can be useful for identifying what that kernel or where that what system that kernel has come from. So I normally follow it with a dash and then something that describes the actual machine. So for example, this is an i5-650 machine, so that, that should be um, sufficient uh, just to identify it. Press enter. Um, and also this uh, will append the version to the version string. So when you've done you name minus a, for example, you'll see that that version string added. Um, let's see what other ones there are here. Okay, this one's useful. Kernel.config support. If you select Y here, uh, the kernel will maintain a copy of this config file that we're editing at the moment. And even better, if you select this here, you'll have access to the config file at all times that this kernel is running. And that can be really useful for propagating the kernel configuration settings, um, especially if you update the kernel. It's just a case of getting the new kernel, doing the make MR proper to clear the system, zcatting this file, procconfig.gz, because the kernel you're running has provided it, doing a make old, old config, um, and then just compiling the new one. So it saves you having to go through setting up a new kernel every time just because you've upgraded the kernel. Really useful, that is. Um, I think that's probably enough for now. There's probably other settings that I'd check for. Um, but as far as general configuration is concerned, that's enough. Um, what we do need to do, do need to do, though, is to look at the hardware side of things a bit closer now. So the first thing I'm going to do before I go any further is to go back into device drivers, which is where the hardware stuff is set up and just check some options here. The first one I'm going to do is to check, um, well, NVMe, yeah, that's default with two off, that's okay. Is to go into SCSI device support and just check that's got disk support set up and CD-ROM support because the SATA driver uses this, so that's okay. I've not got any SCSI hardware in here so really we can get rid of anything that's in this menu there is one there so i believe that's for virtual machines i'm not going to be using that so i'll get rid of that and i'll just get rid of the scuzzy low level drivers because they're definitely not going to be used now i'm going to go into the serial ata and parallel ata drivers and just check that uh the ahci support is enabled which it is by default now that's good um, and I'm going to disable these um, options here because they I don't think this machine's got parallel ATA. I'm not sure now, but certainly the um, CD-ROM and the hard disk are plugged into SATA, not PATA interfaces so I'm going to get rid of all this it's not needed so that just leaves me with the SATA and the AHCI support that should be enough to get things working the other thing I need to look at is network support so let's look at that next uh, again there's a vert IO or Vertio network driver I'm going to disable that because I don't plan on running um, any virtualized stuff on here. What I do need to do, go and do is to enter the Ethernet driver support. Now, I don't need any of these. This is just extra stuff that's going to be compiled or make the kernel bigger. It's completely unnecessary. So what I'm going to do initially is just to get rid of these by pressing space on each one of these to get rid of them. And this means they won't be compiled in. I could also type N 
that these options for no uh, does the same thing. The spacebar just toggles between all the available options. So for example, these ones with angle brackets means you can build them as modules. So if I press space, you can see it toggles between each option. So not compiled in, compiled in as a module, compiled into the monolithic, monolithic module, uh, kernel. The yes and no just immediately sets it to set or not set without going through the module bit. If you want to go straight to module, press M. So I just want to get rid of all of these. In fact, I'll just quickly do no down, no down, no down. All the way to the bottom. Now I want to add in that piece of hardware that I found. Now on Gen 2 and I think on the Endeavor OS, we've got a program called LSPCI which shows all the hardware that's attached to the PCI bus. If you pass in the option minus K, it gives you the kernel modules as well. And this is really useful for identifying what modules you need to build in. And there you can see under the Ethernet controller, this E1000D, which we saw before, and that ties up with what I wrote down. So what I need to do is locate that driver and make sure it's enabled so that the network works when we uh, boot up for the first time. Quick way of doing that is doing forward slash to search for that driver, the uh, 1000E. And it tells me that it's not set at the moment and it tells me where to find it. So under device drivers, network device support, Ethernet device driver support and then Intel devices. Now um, I can look for that, but as somebody's kindly told me on one of my videos previously, you can press this number here in brackets and it'll take you straight there. Now, why that's quite handy, you might not know where that is, so it may still be useful to actually locate that option. So if you're in a hurry, that's quite useful to identify it. Uh, where it is or, or take you to it, but um, you may not be exactly sure. It's nice to see exactly where it is. So I'll go to quit that, go back. You can see the menu there it says network device support. So that's where it was. It was under Ethernet driver support and then it was under Intel. So it was quite a, an easy one actually. So I'll just press yes there or Y there. And if I search for it again, Right, okay, it doesn't tell me anymore apart from Intel devices. So what I'll have to do is just examine each one of these. It's probably not that one because that's a 100 gigabit, or sorry, 100 megabit. Uh, yeah, that one's just called E100, so it's not that one. I'll disable that by pressing no. Let's see if it's that one. No, it's not that one, that's E1000. So I'll press no. It's probably gonna be this one because it's a gigabit and it says it's PCI Express based as well. So I'll just confirm that. And yes, it's that one there, E1000D. All these symbols have got config underscore in front of them. So you can ignore that. But yeah, this is definitely the uh, network card that I want. Do I want this option? Let's read about it. Say yes to enable hardware supported cross time stamping on PCH devices. Well, I may as well leave that. It's set it there by default, so there's no harm in leaving that there. So that's the Ethernet support done. Um, input device support. Uh, we've got keyboards, AT keyboard, that's fine. Mice, PS2 mouse, well we've actually got a USB mouse but that should work generally. Um, you might want to disable it in which case you have to make sure that you've got a USB mouse configured which I'll show you in a minute. Haven't got any joysticks or game pads, no tablets, no touch screens. Miscellaneous devices, I suppose we could enable PC speaker support for some bleeps. Other than that there are specialised devices there. Uh, let's have a look at character devices. Um, 
you can yeah you can sit here for hours adding and deleting stuff i'll leave most of this other stuff here i2c support um we've probably got that if we go back to the hardware list um so the graphics we need to check that um MEI, ME, that's probably something worth looking for. And setting. So there's the type of PCI USB controller. The sound. Another EHCI PCI USB controller. LPC ICH, so that's something else we can set. AHCI, we can check that. Yes, there's a I2C I801 driver that we can set as well. So let's go back to this. And we'll just go to hardware support and it's already set anyway, so that's fine. So we've done the I801 bus, we've done the network adapter. Let's see what's next. Somewhere down there, let's look at the HID support. Okay, we can probably get rid of these. These are specialized devices, unless you know you've got one. There's no real point in having these. For example, I have, do have a side motion keyboard, so I'd leave that set to enable some of the extra buttons on it. I imagine that does. Uh, but otherwise, unless you know you've got some of this hardware, it's no point in having it built in. If you're never going to use it, it's just dead code. Again, Logitech device. I've currently got a Logitech keyboard plugged in. It's not force feedback. Um, whether or not I do need some of these. Probably not. Um, but I could probably set that one. Chances are I'll be plugging a different keyboard at some time anyway, but it might be useful to have that. Uh, Lenovo ThinkPad devices. Let's see what's under that means. This is a Lenovo device, not fully compliant with HID. Okay, so this is just input devices, so I probably don't need that. Okay, that's that. Uh, USB HID support, that's fine. Don't think we need to modi modify anything else there. Uh, USB support we need to go into. Support for USB side, yeah, we can leave that. Uh, what we need to look at in particular is we haven't got USB 3 support, so I'll get rid of that. EHCI, we've seen that we've got two controllers on the motherboard which support the HCI, so definitely want to leave that in. And not sure if that's worth adding. We also want to make sure your yeah, OHCI is enabled for slower speed devices, uh, UHCI as well. I'll remove the printer support because I don't plan on putting a printer with it. I'll leave the USB mass storage support that can be useful for adding in um, USB devices, uh, USB flash devices, for example, or external hard drives, and that should be okay for that. Uh, let's look for the other more obscure things that we saw. We'll do the sound in a minute and the graphics. So we've got this MEI ME module. So let's look for that. So let's do a forward slash, paste that in, and you can see 
it's under miscellaneous devices under device drive so i'm just going to use the one to locate that there it is there i'm just going to add it in directly so that's that feature enabled and the other one was this lpc ich so let's look for that one search for that and again it's not set so let's press one to take it take us straight there press yes to add it in and exit that we've done the sm bus so it looks like all we've got remaining to do is just check the graphics and the sound which sounds not particularly important the graphics generally anything works so they're not as important as say the network which would be quite important if uh, we wanted to carry on for example to build uh, beyond linux from scratch so let's look for this i915 driver so there it is there it's already set that's good we can go in there and check that actually uh, device drivers graphics and it's probably this one here yeah it is so that's already set so that's good so the only thing we've got left is oh there's one other thing we can do here is a boot up logo we select that we'll get some nice little penguins just get rid of the 16 color and the black and white ones we should get some nice little colored penguins one for each core that's available at boot time um yeah sound card support so generally most of these options are fine um, we'll get rid of usb sound devices because we haven't got that we haven't got pcmi uh, PCMCIA devices. Um, not sure if we need that one really, but we do need the PCI audio devices set, but none of these set because these basically to access the HD audio menu, you need PCI audio, uh, sound devices set. So if I get rid of that, you can see you can't get into the HD audio men menu, but by setting that, you open up all these others. And these are a lot older, these sound cards. So just make sure that none of these are set if you're using an HD audio. And the one we want to look for here, where is it? SND HDA Intel. I think this is probably what's already set. Let's just check. Yeah, it is already set. So all we need to do is set up the codec support generally with the intel ones um, i think the real tech is the usual ones um, if the sound well in fact we probably won't have anything to test the sound anyway because it's just going to be a basic linux from scratch system so if it did need fine tuning then we'd have to come back here to select a different codec but generally the real tech one works fine with uh, the intel so that should be all that we need to do. I can't think of anything else that needs to be done to configure the kernel. Um, hopefully we've done enough to uh, enable everything to work on the first boot. If not, we'll have to come back here and rebuild with any other options that we've identified that need to be set. So we'll just exit this and sure you select yes, otherwise you'll lose all the changes you've made and then we can carry on with running make so let's see how long this takes and it will vary depending on what you've got selected uh, what you've got configured if you've really pared down the kernel it can be quite quick if you've elected to build in a lot of stuff it can take a lot lot longer to build um, i'm pretty sure this make on its own respects make flags so let's just check that by running top. Yep, we've got four compilers running all at once. So that does indicate that uh, the parallel compiling is in operation. So as I say, we'll just wait for this to finish compiling now.
Okay, that's finished compiling. So um, the next thing we've got to do is to install any modules. Now, I didn't check to see if modules was turned on or not. Uh, it must have been because it allowed the option M to be put in. So we need to run this in case there's any modules, which there are. It looks like some of it's EFI stuff, so I could have got rid of that, actually. Um, but that's the thing. I've only just gone quickly through the kernel, um, trying to identify things that I know need to be in there. Um, and as you saw, the odd things such as the network adapters that definitely don't need to be in there. Just get rid of anything you don't need. Uh, you, you could certainly spend an hour or more going through each option in the kernel, identifying what you want and what you don't want. Um, I have actually got a video about creating a custom kernel because it can be quite daunting, especially if you've done it the first time. Um, let's see if I can show you that. Um, again, if you go to the playlists on my channel, uh, yeah, it's this one here, building a custom Linux kernel. And there's four videos there about how to um, go through some of the more important options. And even, um, as I suggested before, uh, utilizing that um, config.gz option that can be enabled in the proc file system to easily upgrade. And I'll go through that on the fourth video. So that could be useful for you if you've never done a custom kernel before. So um, the next bit it's saying about if you want to share the, uh, another system's boot partition, um, which in this case I'm not because it's a, an empty machine or it was an empty machine effectively cleared what was on there before. So apart from that, all we need to do is to well, first of all, I'll make sure that I've actually got the boot partition mounted. I uh, should be able to do that in here, actually. Yes, it's mounted. So what we're doing here is copying. This is the actual kernel file that's being copied to the boot partition. Then there's uh, symbols uh, file, a load of symbols in there for the kernel. And finally, a copy of the config file is kept as a backup, which is handy to have as well, even though the kernel's going to have it, and that will go around with the kernel. Um, it's handy to have a separate file anyway. So now we've got to install some documentation for the kernel. It's just a case of copying it in place. Uh, it's important to note the files in the kernel source directory are not owned by root. Whenever a package, whenever a package is unpacked as user root, like we did inside Troot, the files have the user and group IDs of whatever they were on the package's computer. This is usually not a problem for any other package to be installed because the source tree is removed after the installation. However, the Linux source tree is often retained for a long time, which is something I was going to mention, it's worth leaving this source directory, don't tidy up after you've finished. If you want to make a slight adjustment or a tweak, it's quite simple to come here and just do make config again and it will modify the existing settings that you've got, the existing .config and also if the modification doesn't touch too many areas of the kernel, what you'll find is just that part of the kernel will be built, it will be a lot quicker the second time round. Um, so, because, yeah, it can be retained for a long time, because of this, there is a chance that whatever the user ID the packager used will be assigned to somebody on the machine. This person would then have right access to the kernel source. So, because of that, it recommends to run chone minus r00, which is the root, roots user and root group on the Linux uh, directory. So, let's do that now. So that's done. So you can see everything's owned by root now. There's a warning there about creating a sim link to user source Linux. Uh, must not be used on an LFS, LFS system. And there's something there about the headers as well. Uh, that they should never be replaced by the raw kernel headers because ones we've got in user include are sanitized ones. There's something here about configuring, configuring modules 
uh, and the load order if you need to deal with certain modules loading in a certain order then that's something you'll need to read but otherwise in a straightforward system such as this you won't need to do that so let's come out of the Linux directory as I said I'm not going to delete that in case I need it to make some modifications or get some new hardware and something else needs to be compiled into the kernel and instead we'll move straight on to using grub to set up the boot process and again if you've got UEFI you'll be wanting to use the instructions in the VLFS page rather than these uh, instructions there's a warning here about grub configuring it incorrectly can render your system inoperable without an alternative boot device such as a CD-ROM or bootable USB drive. This section is not required to boot your LFS system, it's just a way um, to modify the current bootloader. Uh, you might just want to modify it. So it gives some instructions here of how to create your own bootable device. Um, I always say this, I find it a little bit pointless. It's nice to see some instructions on how to do that. But we've booted from a live USB device, i.e. a CD-ROM or, or a USB device. Um, I find a little point in doing that. If this fails, I'll just boot up the Gen 2 uh, USB again and try and fix it within that environment. So setting up the configuration, what we're going to do is to run grub install and this will erase any existing boot record um, that exists obviously we saw earlier on there is no boot record at the moment so it'll install a boot record for us um, and just ensure if you've got several disks on the machine that you are installing to the right uh, disk so being this is the only disk effectively in the machine my SDB is the boot device uh, that I've booted from to build LFS but as far as booting the machine with the internal hard drive, uh, devsda is the correct designation. So I'll just run this command. Don't worry about the fact that it says i386. That just uh, means a generic Intel platform, if you like. So it says installation finished. No error reported. The next thing we need to do is to create a config file so that, so that when Grub boots, it knows what to boot and where to find it. So I've created that. We now need to edit that in boot grub and it's called grub.config. And the things we need to modify here are the root device, which is on, this is where it gets sticky, I always get confused with this. Um, Right, I'm pretty sure the hard the HD means hard disk. So zero is the first device. We've only got one device, so that's correct. Uh, the partition numbers, I think, off the top of my head, if I remember rightly, start at one. So Bing's our um, root. Uh, let me think now. Yes, this will be the boot file system. So this is setting the root of the boot partition. So we need to change this two to a one. So that's the first partition on the first disk. If you remember, um, the Uh, what are the, does it start at zero now? In fact, it might be zero it starts at, come to think of it. So, if this doesn't work, then I know that I've got to change that to a one for the first partition. I wish I could remember this. It, it's something I do, you know, so infrequently, as you might imagine, setting up a, a system like this. Um, I can never remember what it should be. So, yeah, we'll try zero as the first partition. If you remember when I did, uh, let's save this, fdisk minus l slash s slash sda, so that's our internal hard disk. The boot 
yeah, the boot partition is the first partition, the swap is the second, and the root partition is the third. So this is referring, although it says root, it's saying to uh, set the root of the boot partition because it needs to know where to find the kernel file, which is what's specified here. So this menu entry, there's a bit of text that will appear on the screen here. And we're telling it where to find the kernel. Now, because we've got a separate boot partition, we don't need to specify that that boot partition is under the boot subdirectory because within that partition, the kernel is actually at the root. So if you hadn't created a separate boot partition like I had done, then you would need to leave that bit in. But as we've got a separate boot partition, you do need to remove it and just uh, leave the um, leading forward slash in to say that this file is on the root. Then we need to specify the actual root partition of the system. So this is the real root partition as uh, the Linux kernel see, uh, yeah, as the Linux kernel sees it. And as you saw before, our root partition is SDA3. So we put a three in there. And then finally, the RO tells Grub to mount the partition read only. And I think part of the boot scripts actually sets the partition to read write. And it's useful to set it to read only in case of some problem booting. It means that the partition won't have any changes to it. It's less likely to be corrupted if there is a problem. Uh, during the boot process. So we leave that as read only. And as I say, I'm pretty sure it's a boot, one of the boot scripts that modifies the uh, read write axis. In fact, it might be the point where the file system table is re read um, because we haven't got a read only there and we've got the defaults set. So it would mount it as read write. That's probably the point where um, it is remounted and set to read write. But that, in theory, apart from this uh, boot partition, which I'm not sure about, uh, we'll find out about that when we boot, if it fails the boot, and I'll show you how we can easily modify that if it does, uh, if it has been set incorrectly. Apart from that, we'll set that, save that. Um, it says there, from Grub's perspective, the kernel files are relative to the partitions you use. So if you use a separate boot partition, which we did, remove the boot. Otherwise, you leave it in. Um, you'll also need to change the set root line to point to the boot location, which we've done. Um, it does say here that you can use UUID to um, set that now i've tried to set the root partition now, i've tried this in the past and it didn't work and i did read that it only works with um if you've used an initial ram disk which we've not used here so it looks like that might not be true um so i haven't actually played around with this i've tried this myself so maybe that's something that i need to do for for the future um i can't remember that i've ever read about this before in the Linux from scratch book. I might be wrong, but uh, it's certainly the first time I've noticed any mention of booting using the UUID in the same way that we did in the file system table. Uh, oh yes, this is worth mentioning. If you don't run grub make config, if you do it overwrite the uh, grub configuration file that we've created, um, and it will destroy any customization. So uh, be careful with that. 